Daniel Cook's Motionless Generator. In 1871, Daniel Cook obtained U.S. Patent 119,825 for an improvement in induction coils. The highly respected Dr. Harold Aspton considered this to be a very serious piece of equipment, operating as paired cross-linked capacitors, and his opinion carries very considerable weight. It is a very simple device which could be interesting to test, especially as it does not involve any electronics or complicated construction. Howard Haley who is an experienced free energy developer, says what Cook is saying is this, electricity will always flow from a high voltage to a low voltage. Cook uses the principle of a spike collapsing back EMF in such a way that the current constantly flows in the same direction. In this process it constantly overcomes the initial current which is of opposite polarity. It constantly increases in voltage until the limit of the components is reached. In order to start it, you can use another coil superimposed on top which induces the start current, or alternatively, you can use a magnet to generate the starting current. The device then goes into runaway mode so you have to use sufficient insulation and sufficient diameter wire to prevent fire. He then uses an ingenious device to prevent runaway in the form of a powerful rheostat. The rheostat is then shorted to draw power out of the system. The rheostat prevents the device from shutting down. Cook states that you need sufficient length of wire for the device to work. He recommends using 2000 feet of wire. He also uses a long and thick iron core. This will have the effect of limiting the frequency to manageable levels and it will also limit the high voltage to a realistic value. I believe that this is Thomas Henry Moray's secret and that the long wires which Moray used, were deliberate misdirection. Moray used an electromagnet to induce his starting current. I also believe that this is also Stephen Mark's secret. A further point which I have discovered in conjunction with experiments made by Groomage is that all of these devices need static electricity to operate. This explains why Moray's device sometimes would not start, i.e. damp weather. These OU devices are in fact static electricity vortex or suction devices. Also Bedini's devices work less well at night, when static electricity intensity is reduced by lack of sunlight, hence creating morning dew. Examining the Daniel Cook patent, draws attention to the use of obsolete terms which can be found in the 1842 book Manual of Magnetism by Daniel Davis Jr. The Cook patent does use some terms which may not be familiar to many people as they are terms which were common 170 years ago but are not commonly used today. Daniel Davis uses these terms, which makes them easier to understand. For example, he envisages that each coil will have a screw connector called a cup at each end of the wire and so, instead of referring to the ends of a coil, he refers to the cups of that coil. Davis also performs some experiments which may help us to understand how Daniel Cook's motionless generator works. Some of the experiments performed are familiar and some are not. He starts by constructing wet cell batteries using copper and zinc electrodes with a copper sulfate solution between them. He observes that with two or more connected in series, that the electrical effect is greater, this is normal and what we would expect when connecting batteries together in series. He also determines that the power which such a battery can provide, increases as the wetted surface area increases. This is not surprising, but this effect can produce an unexpected effect. The methods of detection of electrical effects used by Davis include a galvanometer, which is effectively, a voltmeter, and the intensity of an electrical shock felt by a human being holding the ends of an induction coil. For this, Davis winds a pancake coil from flat, insulated metallic ribbon, and places it in various positions near a large helically wound coil which has a large number of turns. When the switch S is closed, the coils act as an air core transformer and the rapidly changing current flow in coil A induces a voltage in coil B. That induced voltage is high as coil B has many turns and a substantial shock can be felt when the ends of that coil are held as shown above. Davis then found that placing several thin metal sheet between the coils had little effect but if a 2.5 mm thick iron plate is used, then there is little or no induced voltage in coil B. Interestingly, if a radial slot is cut in that plate, 
then it has little or no effect on the induced voltage and strong shocks are again felt. The induced voltage is very short in duration when the switch is closed as the current flowing through coil A reaches a steady state very rapidly and so there is no longer a varying magnetic field. An interesting effect is seen if the switch is left closed and one of the battery plates is raised, reducing its wetted surface area. An induced voltage is produced in coil B for the entire duration of the plate movement, producing a much longer overall effect. The galvanometer shows that the voltage across coil A is effectively unchanged and yet the induced voltage continues. Presumably, this is from the resistance of coil A being so low that the current flow through it is limited by the battery's ability to supply current, and so, raising one plate reduces the current through the coil without changing the supply voltage, and the reducing current flow in the coil produces a reducing magnetic field and a long period of output from coil B. Davis then experiments with cascading coils to see if the much higher induced voltage can produce an even greater effect in an additional coil, and finds that it does. Davis makes the following observations about the direction of current flow for induced voltages in a chain of coils which are widely spread apart to avoid magnetic interaction. That is to say, the direction of current flow is not caused by magnetic induction, but instead, solely by back EMF. For this, he uses a plus sign plus to indicate current flow in one direction, and a minus sign, to indicate current flow in the opposite direction. He cascades seven coils like this. The flow directions are then. Coil 1 at switch on and at switch off are plus. Coil 2 at switch on are minus, and at switch off are plus. Coil 3 at switch on are plus, and at switch off are minus. Coil 4 at switch on R minus, and at switch off R plus. Coil 5 at switch on R plus, and at switch off R minus. Coil 6 at switch on R minus, and at switch off R plus. Coil 7 at switch on R plus, and at switch off R minus. The patent drawings give an impression of a small, compact device. That is not the case as the smallest size indicated by Daniel Cook is a bundle of iron wires 600 mm, 2 feet, in length and 50 mm, 2 inches, in diameter, wound with coils which have at least 150 meters, 500 feet, of wire in each coil, and ideally, twice that length of wire. When completed, this is a large and heavy device and it is likely that miniature versions will not work. Cook says. My invention relates to the combination of two or more, simple or compound, helical coils with iron cores or magnets, in such a manner as to produce a constant electric current without the aid of a battery. Fig 1 represents the different parts of a compound helical coil and iron core. Fig 2 is a perspective view of my invention. In carrying out my invention, I do not confine myself to any particular mode of coil construction or to any particular size of wire, observing only that the quantity of wire in the various coils must be sufficient to produce the required result, also, the material used to insulate the wires must be suitable for producing the required result. However, I generally prefer to use the same size of wire in the construction of both simple and compound coils. When constructing simple coils, to produce the required voltage and current, it is desirable to use a long iron core as shown as A in Fig 1. This iron core may be 2, 3 or even 6 feet in length, and 2, 3 or more inches in diameter. The coil should be wound from good quality copper wire, insulated with silk or shellac. The iron core A may be a solid bar or a bundle of separate iron wires, the latter giving better results and providing more current for any given wire diameter. While the wire may be fine or coarse, I prefer to use number 16, 1.23 mm diameter, or even thicker wire, as the power output is in proportion to the length and diameter of the wire. When using compound coils, it is preferable in some cases to use a small wire, say, number 30, 0.255 mm diameter, or even less, for the primary coil, and number 16 or even larger for the secondary coil. With this combination, the initial secondary current of the primary coil being very small in comparison to the terminal secondary current of the secondary coil, 
offers little resistance to the terminal secondary, hence a quicker action is obtained. Alternatively, the primary coil may be of uninsulated wire coiled into a solid helix, being insulated only between the coils, in which case there is little or no opposing initial secondary current. Helically wound coils alone with large quantities of wire will produce similar results. A ribbon spiral may be substituted for the secondary coil C, say, of 3, 6, 12 or 24 inches in width and of any convenient length, but always of sufficient length to raise its output current to the level necessary to sustain itself through its action on the primary coil B. In the use of compound coils, it is important that the secondary coil should be wound in the same direction as the primary coil, and the primary and secondary coils be cross-connected as shown in Fig 2. The action will then be as follows. The secondary current of the secondary coil C, will circulate through the opposite primary coil B, while at the same instant, a secondary current from the primary coil B will be generated and circulate through the opposite secondary coil C, both currents flowing in the same direction in the opposite coils B and C, producing a combined magnetic action on the iron core A in the center. The opposing initial secondary currents of the two coils B and C being overpowered, do not show in the main circuit D of the device, there being eight distinct currents developed in the action of one entire circuit of the two pairs of coils, two terminal and two initial secondary currents to each pair of coils, the four initial secondaries constantly opposing the circulation of the four terminal secondary currents, but the initial secondaries being of much lower voltage and current than those of the terminal secondary, are overcome, leaving a sufficient surplus terminal power to overcome the resistance of the primary wire and charge the bar A to the degree needed to reproduce itself in the opposite secondary coil. By this means, a constant current is kept flowing in all of the coils. These coils may be constructed using 500 feet to 1000 feet or more for each of the primary and secondary coils. The longer, and better insulated the wire, the greater is the power obtained from the device. The larger the wire diameter, the greater the current obtained. If only single coils are to be used, it is preferable to have a wire length of 1000 feet or more in each coil. The action is the same as with the compound coils, but only four currents are produced, two initial and two terminal currents, the latter flowing constantly in the same direction, in effect, there being only one current in the same direction. The action in the coils may be started by using a permanent magnet, an electromagnet or by pulsing an extra coil wound around the outside of one of the coils of the device. If the load circuit is broken for any reason, the current stops immediately. It is then necessary to perform the start-up procedure again to get the device restarted. This can be overcome by permanently connecting a resistor across the terminal of the load so that if the load circuit is broken, the device can continue under very much reduced current until the load is restored. By this means, the device becomes the direct equivalent of a battery. A rheostat D may be introduced into the main circuit to limit the current and prevent the overheating of the coils through the drawing of excessive amounts of current. The iron cores may also be used for producing electromagnetic motion when the device is operating. In 1870 there was nothing much in the way of electronic components available to Daniel who did exceptionally well to produce his self-powered design. With its size of 0.6 to 1.8 meters in length and the substantial weight of the iron cores, it does not lend itself to mobile applications. With present-day components, Daniel's system can be reproduced in a much more compact and lighter form. I don't know who originated it, but I recently came across the Renerator circuit which shows the Daniel Cook design using toroids, presumably ferrite, instead of the long iron cores wound with coils, and diodes used to control the feedback. It is clear that the power output of such an arrangement will be limited by the capacity of the toroids to carry magnetic flows and so I might suggest that the nanoperm nanotechnology high-performance toroids such as the Magnatech Shop toroid from Magnatech GmbH might improve performance. However, please understand clearly that I have not built this circuit and while I believe that it would work well, Experimentation will be needed in order to find the best working arrangements. The circuit is shown like this. The Renerator. 
Magnet field as created by actuator coil. Permanent magnet. Every second wave, marked red, coming from the output coils is the actuator pulse for the input coils to block magnetic field of permanent magnet. The permanent field retracts from core inducing a current flow in the output coils, after the input pulse is gone, the permanent magnet will restore magnetic field in the core, causing back EMF in the output coils. You will notice that the direction of the coil windings is not specified and so it is left up to you to arrange the magnets and input windings so that they oppose each other. It seems certain that the circuit will oscillate at its resonant frequency and that frequency will be high. As Daniel found it necessary to control the current with a rheostat, it might be advisable to place controls on the circuit to prevent runaway from the positive feedback used in the circuit. A circuit breaker placed between the two toroids could impose a safety limit on current and protect the insulation of the wiring. A metal oxide varistor placed across one of the input coils could be used to limit the voltage generated if that is found to be necessary. I would expect a good deal of experimentation to be needed to find a good working circuit, and so I asked my friend Edmund Cook who is experienced in the use of simulation software, to assess the circuit and its operation so that there could be some assessment of what factors have the greatest effect. The magnet strength relative to the quality and size of the toroid has to be important because if the magnet puts the toroid into saturation, that would probably not be helpful in power production, but that, of course, is merely my uninformed opinion and test results are the only way to optimize the circuit. Having examined the circuit, Edmund states that the arrangement should be different and he has produced the following diagram. Edmund says, each output coil's half wave, shown in red, is the opposing input coil's actuating pulse, which opposes the permanent magnet's magnetic field influence on the toroid core. Note how this cyclic blocking and augmentation creates a natural resonance between the coils as the ebb and flow of current is regenerated and sustained by the permanent magnets. Particularly noteworthy are the self-enhancing characteristics developed by unifying the directions of the windings and the polarity placements of the magnets and both the outputs and inputs subsequent collapsing fields counter EMF. I find the structure of this circuit to be fascinating, especially when considering how the directions of the windings and the subsequent collapsing fields can be used directly to influence, and therefore, accentuate the overall field strength of each coil. The directions of all the windings are of critical importance for not only the fields on each toroid and the intended function of the diode, but also for the proper interactions between the two, intensely interlaced output coils. The original drawing was dysfunctional on numerous details. This circuit has two outputs and no external inputs and so it needs to be started by applying an AC signal to one of the two magnet coil pairs. As already mentioned, I personally, would prefer there to be protection in the circuit against overvoltage or the current rising to an unacceptably high level which would cause overheating of the wire and possible damage to the insulation of the wire. While a fuse is shown in the following diagram, I would prefer a circuit breaker. The metal oxide varistor is chosen for whatever voltage you intend to run the circuit at, and the diodes need to be able to handle more current than the wire can manage. I would suggest that fast acting diodes are used. These measures should not affect the operation of the circuit and it is likely that many people would consider them to be unnecessary. However, if you wish to include them, then I would suggest the following circuit arrangement. If you build this circuit and get it going, then please let me know about it with details of the coils, toroids and magnets used so that your success can help other replicators.